Patricia's Vision, The Doctor Who Saved Sight, by Michelle Lord, illustrated by Aliana Harris. Harlem, New York City, late 1940s. Young Patricia Bath was curious. She peered at a man begging for coins. Folks in her neighborhood strolled past him, but Patricia watched and wondered. Why are his eyes cloudy? How did it happen? She shut her eyes and pondered. What's it like to live in the dark? Other little girls played nurse, but six-year-old Patricia declared, I want to be a doctor. All the doctors Patricia knew were men. A medical degree required years and years of study and cost money Patricia's family didn't have, but she saw possibility when others couldn't. Both of her parents stressed the importance of education and hard work. Her mother cooked and cleaned a Park Avenue apartment to save money for Patricia's education. She encouraged her daughter's interest in science by surprising her with a chemistry set. Patricia learned about the big, wide world from her father's stories of working aboard merchant ships. She knew an education would take her places. All the while, Patricia doctored her dolls, poking her needle into the tattered cloth and back through the other side. She stitched, she snipped, and she knotted. She mended her dolls with bandages, splints, and neat stitches and never lost sight of her dream. Patricia grew, and so did her curiosity. In high school, science made Patricia's pulse race. Other teens watched TV. Patricia pressed her eyes to a microscope, inspecting insects she caught. Patricia loved learning. She worked hard and kept her eye on the future. I was always a curious child. In college, she memorized, she multiplied, and she measured. When she wasn't poring over beakers, burners, or ionic bonds, she volunteered to read to the blind. Four years passed in a blur. In medical school, she studied everything from broken bones to kidney stones, inside and out, from head to toe. By the time she finished, she knew exactly what kind of doctor she wanted to be, an ophthalmologist, a surgeon who treats the eyes. After four years of medical school, she slipped out of her cap and gown and into a crisp white coat. She was now Dr. Patricia Bath. I decided to get the training, education, skill set so I could achieve miracles. Dr. Bath tackled her first project in her own Harlem neighborhood. So many blind patients gathered at the Harlem Hospital Eye Clinic. Dr. Bath wondered, why? She wanted excellent eye care for everyone. Most of these patients had never been examined by an ophthalmologist. Swallowing her sorrow, she asked her professors to help. They said yes and operated for free. Dr. Bath saw possibility when others couldn't. Eyesight is a basic human right. Dr. Bath couldn't wait to begin her career as an ophthalmologist. She moved across the country to join the famed Jules Stein Eye Institute in California. Walking into work that first morning, she had no idea she was the first woman in the faculty. Her eyes widened upon finding her new office. Away from the others. In the basement. Next to the lab animals. She marched upstairs and demanded a workspace equal to what the other new professors had. At times, she wondered why the others took the easy cases of the rich and famous. They gave Dr. Bath the difficult patients, but she strained her lab coat and got to work. Taking the high road may be arduous and long, but it will lead to justice and triumph. She was proud to care for the so-called hopelessly blind. What if I could give my patients the gift of sight, she wondered. Other doctors said, it's impossible. Dr. Bath said, I choose miracles. Tip tap, tip tap, a blind veteran found his way to her office. Dr. Bath decided the best treatment was to replace his damaged cornea, the covering of the eyeball, with an artificial cornea. I felt that being able to restore sight to the blind was really the highest call of what I could do. In the operating room, 
Under hot lights, she squinted through a microscope for hours, cutting away scar tissue, fitting a plastic cornea until her fingers ached. An artificial cornea contains a tiny tube that projects the light and returns patient's vision. Dr. Bath placed the device through his cornea, sewing it into place. She wove her needle in and out as she had when she was a little girl. When Dr. Bath peeled away the bandages, her patient's face shined like a lamp. I can see the light! With her help, patients read signs, marveled at colors, and walked without canes. They even drove cars! Dr. Bath saw possibility when others couldn't. Each time I have restored or improved someone's vision through surgery, it's a very special moment. One day, a patient called on Dr. Bath for help. Shining a bright light into her patient's eyes, Dr. Bath discovered the problem. She shook her head. A thin layer of tissue, called a membrane, had grown in the eye after surgery. The woman could no longer see. Dr. Bath spent many sleepless nights tossing and turning, wondering how to help. One night, she had an idea. A laser. A laser makes a narrow beam of light so narrow that it becomes intense, so intense that it can cut like a knife. Other doctors use lasers on the skin, inside the body, and sometimes focused inside the eye. Never before had doctors used a laser tool that could be guided with the ease and control of a pencil. This was Dr. Bath's new idea. How could she take it from her imagination to the operating room? In her mind, she saw a probe that could focus a laser beam through a tiny fiber as thin as a single strand of hair. Dr. Bath remembered the man with the cloudy eyes from her childhood. Doctors already use lasers on the cornea. Why not on a cloudy lens, she thought. Boom! She realized her laser probe design could be used to remove cataracts, a common condition where the lens of the eye turns cloudy and causes blindness. Unthinkable! Preposterous! It can't be done, said the other doctors. But she kept thinking big thoughts about the tool that didn't exist. Yet. Remember that the limits of science are not the limits of your imagination. Dr. Bath traveled to Europe in 1986 to experiment with the best lasers. She planned, plotted, and predicted Finally, she gathered parts for a tool that only existed in her mind. IV tubing, stainless steel pipe, optical fibers. She wasted no time. She fitted, she fashioned, she fused, and she refused to give up. She had to see if her idea worked. Alone, long after midnight, raindrops pelted the window as Dr. Bath tested different lasers on eye tissue. Her mind churned. Maybe, possibly, this could work. She aimed the argon fluoride laser at the lens and fired, but the cataract was still there. Next, she fired the krypton fluoride laser. Still, not enough power. Dr. Bath leaned close. If the wavelength wasn't just right, the eyeball might burst. She aimed the xenon chloride laser and fired. Pop, pop, pop. Although she could not see the laser beam, she watched the cataract vaporize in a few zaps. Dr. Bath tossed her papers into the air. Eureka! Her invention worked. She called the new tool the laser phaco probe. Back home, she applied for a patent an official document to prove that she was the inventor of the laser FACO, and she waited. I was not seeking to be the first. I was only attempting to do my thing. Months later, Dr. Bath found an envelope from the United States Patent and Trademark Office in her mailbox. Her hands trembled as she ripped open the flap. On May 17, 1988, Dr. Bath was granted her first patent for her laser FACO probe. Her eyes flooded with tears of joy. Even in retirement, Dr. Bath never lost sight of her goal. While climbing Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, 
she learned about a school for the blind. When she visited, she found a mud building, a classroom without braille books, and children in need. Her heart sank. She hunted all around town, but couldn't find so much as a magnifying glass to help them see. What could she do? She returned home, but wondered. Do these children have a future? What do they need? How can I help? Once again, Dr. Bath saw a way where others could not. Technology. If the children could not read words with their eyes, they could read braille computer keyboards with their fingertips. Dr. Bath sent computers to the school in Tanzania. Now the students could read words and calculate homework problems. Computers gave them not only books, but a world of information where their lives before had been dark. Here, too, she gave the gift of sight. She called it computer vision. In my childhood, I developed a love and respect for humanity and wanted to help heal the sick. I believe that someday the blind will see. Dr. Patricia Bath saw possibility wherever she went.